Comics Coast to Coast is brought to you by patrons like you. If you'd like to help the show out, head on over to patreon.com forward slash comics C to C and show us a little bit of your love. Your sweet, sweet love. I mean, like a dollar's worth of love. And we'll take that love and hug it and squeeze it and make it do podcast things that you'll enjoy. So come on, see what happens. This is Comics Coast to Coast. Hey everybody, this is Brian Dunaway, and you're listening to Comics Coast to Coast episode 325, the Alex Redfish interview. Before we talk to Alex, I'm going to reach over here and give my good buddy Joel Duggan a hug and welcome back to the show. We've missed you. Oh, thanks, man. Good to be back. Absolutely. You were gone for a few weeks. You had some projects you were wrapping up. And uh, how's it going? It's going really well. And fans of this podcast might also recognize Starcrossed is back. Uh, I've had a number of comics posted in February. So I'm back to drawing Starcrossed weekly now. So weekly. So you're doing one a week? Yeah, I'm not. I, I, previously, I had stuck to uh, Monday as like the, the the new comic day, but right. now it's just as long as I get it done per week, I'm good. That is the <laughs> that is the mandate because there are other things that come up, and um, also I have to balance. I find that um, I'm getting old, Brian. A lot of time at the drawing table is is bad on the back, so I have to rather than jamming it all out in one day, I kind of have to space it out, which is actually more enjoyable. I have to say. I agree. I agree 100%. Also, speaking of enjoyable, Matthew Descharm of Matt the Wad is back with us again this week. Matt, how are you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're doing it on a Saturday. Can you believe it? And there's good reason for that, and you'll find out why in just a moment uh, as I introduce our wonderful host, Alex Redfish. How are you, good sir? Uh, I'm good. Hi. Hi. So if uh, if you're uh, not familiar with Alex's work, he is a visual effects artist uh, and you probably can most easily find his work on alexredfish.deviantart.com. Is that a good place, Alex? Yeah. ArtStation, DeviantArt, Vimeo. Right. ArtStation, Vimeo. I, I love your work on Vimeo, by the way. And Thanks. Alex, thank you for taking the time. Uh, to sit down with us and talk about your work. Alex, would you mind telling our audience a little bit about yourself and your visual effects work? Yeah, sure. Well, my name is Alex Redfish. Well, my internet name, my real name is Alexei Mishirin. Oh. Yeah, but so Alex Redfish is actually my uh, nickname, which I is... I like it. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm a special effects artist. Uh, I specialize in uh, hand-drawn style animation, right. uh, mostly frame by frame hand-drawn animation. Wow. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and also uh, trying to implement all this stuff in 3D engines sometimes. So I didn't know. So you are doing it like frame by frame, because that was one of the things I was interested in asking you about on your special effects. I just assumed a lot of this stuff was based on like particle systems like you would see in like Blender or After Effects, but you do some frame by frame animation uh, I, as well. I knew as soon as I saw them, they had to be hand drawn. You only get stuff looking that good if, uh, if it's purposeful. Right. Interesting. Yeah, there are some like particle systems uh, involved, but they all use hand-drawn uh, animated textures. So most of the work is done uh, uh, by hand. Right, right. Frame by frame. Old school way. Love oh. it. Yeah, it's really yeah, good. See, it's nothing fantastic. looks as good as that. You know, it's... <laughs> You can use the particle stuff, and yeah, it may end up looking more realistic, but if you want it to look really cool and stylized like what Alex is doing, yeah, you got to do the frame by frame. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. It has uh, its own unique charm. 
it's it's yeah. better than reality in my opinion. <laughs> it it really does and this has become a very popular style especially in uh, some of the games you've been working on some of these mobile games like Dungeon Defenders 2 uh, with some of the stuff you sent us to look at uh, yep. which is that is that a mobile game Dungeon Defenders 2? Uh no, it's on PC and uh consoles. I think the the first game was ported to mobile mm -hmm. platforms uh and uh, but the second one I think it's only on uh, PC and consoles. Right, right. Now, can you describe to us uh what the difference is between um regular animation and special effects animation? Uh, well, regular animation, I suppose, includes like characters and mm -hmm. other stuff, while special effects is like fire, smoke, magical effects, which is uh, some of the stuff you can uh, ob observe in real life. But right, right. Consi considering... Uh, there are lots of like fantasy games, mm -hmm. sci-fi games. You have to, uh, how do you say, it? <laughs> invent a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, th there's no uh, any references in reality. Right. But you should make it look kind of believable. Mm -hmm. So. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> a that's a really good way to explain it. Uh, because I, I was, I, I, I never really thought much about it. I've, I've studied some animation, but I'm certainly not as well versed as Joel or Matt. Uh, and I never really gave much thought to the special effects part. I knew they were there, but I've always had my eyes trained on the character animations. I guess that's what appealed to me. So seeing your work, and seeing it by itself, in like on Vimeo, I'm just blown away with how much life you've given these uh, effects. They're like their own characters. Yeah, I'm really glad you like them. <laughs> right. Well, the like the special effects animation is kind of a very niche specialization. There are. Uh, way more, way less uh, special effects animators than character animators. Right. I guess the characters are more appealing, mm -hmm. but it also, it requires lots of very different knowledge from uh, uh, character animation because like mm -hmm. the physics of the way how uh, these elements like smoke and fire work in uh, real life are uh, very complex and oh, yeah. it's uh, quite hard to understand how it all works and considering there's not very much of uh, info and tutorial mm -hmm. tutorials on the internet right. it uh, might be pretty tricky right right That's good. when you're when you're looking at animating something like smoke or fire or water what kind of reference material do you look for? Do you do you go for video, or do you go for other animation? Uh, going for the video reference is good to get the understanding of the overall movement, and uh, watching the finished animation is uh, good for reference referencing the style because it's. There are like two uh, steps in uh, making a special effect. At first, you mm -hmm. need to understand how it actually works. And but if you only uh, do this step, and uh, you will make a the special uh, special effects animation that looks kind of believable, but it might not look appealing because you also want each frame to look good and <laughs> making some abs abstract shapes look good is a 
tricky because what what is looking good <laughs> right so uh yeah uh, i usually reference like anime and uh, old uh, fighting games to get mm. the feeling for the style and the overall shapes and uh, i study slow motion videos of uh, real life uh, effects to understand the movement that's really cool i was i was going to ask you about slow motion video being such a big thing right now and such a easily accessible by a lot of people i imagine that would give you just a wealth of of information when you're trying to figure out just exactly how an effect actually works yeah it sucks actually was like a huge discovery to uh to find these videos and oh it's gold <laughs> it's uh, yeah. way easier to uh get the feeling for the movement when you can actually uh watch it frame by frame exactly like how you will draw it i completely yeah. understand the the reference to street fighter as well like there were certain animations that i was definitely thinking of that and i, I was even finding myself thinking of like games like metal slug where it was just this yeah. really gorgeous you know hot, uh, pixel art sort of thing and it was all hand drawn you could tell and it's just gorgeous stuff hmm. yeah and uh, unfortunately it's i in my opinion it's uh, getting a bit lost these uh, techniques as everything is moving to 3d and eventually uh, hand drawn style to the animation is uh, kind of dying right. I, I don't think it will completely disappear but uh, it's not as huge as it was uh, sometime earlier and right. it's a shame because uh, i think with uh, new technologies and uh, old 2d hand drawn uh, skills it might be a good Mm, combo to uh, make some something look uh, very pretty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can totally say. Oh, by the way, we did not mention, and I I should have mentioned this at the top of the show. Alex is he he lives in Russia, works in Russia. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about your visual effects market in Russia? Is there a huge demand there? Or is some of your work coming more from outside Russia? Uh, yeah. The game industry and animation industry isn't that big in Russia. Right. It's, uh, there are some companies that uh, are making games and uh, animation movies, but it's way smaller than uh, like in the U.S., for example. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, most of the time I work uh, for, uh, for companies outside of Russia. It's right. uh, usually there are a bit more interesting projects. So yeah, it's just more appealing. Right. Right. Totally. I have so go ahead. Of a technical question. Uh, hopefully this uh, translates well, but, uh, so when you're animating these effects, are you using um, keys and in-betweens process, or are you just kind of animating it frame after frame after frame? Yeah, I usually go for straight ahead approach, uh, frame one, frame two, frame frame three. It uh, for me personally, uh, it will uh, I will get better results with uh, this approach. Sometimes when I'm working on a animation, like not for a game, but uh, for a like trailer or movie. Uh, there, I might use uh, some um, keyframes because uh, you need uh, these frames to come out come out exactly on time with the uh, like character animation or right. Uh, background animation so sometimes you need uh, to be 
very precise with the already established timing. So in sometimes I use uh, keyframes and then in between them. Hmm. But most of the time, uh, straight ahead. I, you know, I, I kind of agree with what you said. A lot of times when I have to do effects animation, I find for whatever reason, it's easier to just do it one drawing after the other as opposed to using keyframes. Yeah, I, in uh, special effects animation, there's there's usually lots of stuff you need to keep track of. It's uh, what is uh, hard about it. You have like animating fire, and you have like dozens of elements that should move in a uh, particular way. You need to keep track of how each uh, part is moving and uh, when you're doing it straight ahead it's i think it's easier to keep track of it hmm. makes sense yeah uh, when you, when you're um when you're doing that when you're going straight ahead do you have an idea in your head on the dynamic timing because what i mean when i was animating i would i would have to rely on keyframes and in-betweens as Matt had said to make sure that my slow in and slow out and like all that kind of stuff was on time so do you have it planned out in your in your head first or do you kind of tweak as you go uh, well I have like the planned it in my head most of the time but uh, I tweak sometimes uh, it, it's okay uh, sometimes I remove a couple of frames or uh, I might add a, a one a single in between frame to make it a bit slower, mm. but w with experience, it's uh, getting a bit uh, easier to uh, get the timing you were expecting in your head. It's uh, you kind of getting used to how to draw like explosion or. Uh, lightning strike right right and with with the games that you work on i would imagine that while everything has to look unique there's probably only so many different ways that you can do the effects from a medium power punch you know like it, it's probably going to have roughly the same timing throughout most games uh yeah working for games is you usually uh, working on like abilities animations yeah. and some most of the time they uh, you just like enhancing the character animation which was done earlier uh, so you already have a uh, like character punching and it already has uh, established timing so you just have to mimic the timing and uh, enhance it with some uh, flashy stuff. Hmm. Now, what tools are you using, Alex, to create these effects? Are you, uh, what software are you using? I'm mostly working in uh, Adobe Flash, which is now uh, Adobe Animate. Right. It's not the best software for uh, <laughs> this kind of work. <laughs> I'm just very used to it. I uh, want to change it for something more, <laughs> I, I don't want to say like professional, but more uh, <laughs> specialized for what I'm doing. Right. But oh, uh, I uh, just don't have the time to <laughs> learn <laughs> something uh, new. I love uh, having an animator on because he's completely echoing most of my thoughts on animation because I also use Flash a lot, but I same as you, I've been like keeping an eye open, looking for like, okay, is there something better I could be using? And uh, yeah, same as you, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of good things in uh, Flash which are not represented in a uh, like 
more professional software. Uh, I mean, more specialized software. Right. And but like the brushes in Flash are just bad. Right. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, very hard to draw. But right. uh, like movie clips and uh, timetable, it's it's just so uh, easy to use. Mm-hmm. True. So if you if you could, what software would you like to be able to use instead of uh, animate? Uh, I saw like Toon Boom software, which yes. uh, lots of people are uh, they are getting very good results uh, with it, and uh, it's I think it's like the standard in two mm. D animation. Uh, I think it's uh, vector based as well, which is a uh, very important to me because making animations for games you need to be able to change the size without losing the quality often so vector based uh, software is uh, very important right that's interesting because I used Toon Boom uh, like probably a decade and a half ago it's probably changed a lot since I've used it, but it is a great program. And I think what's been keeping me from it is, frankly, the cost. It's it's pretty expensive. Uh, but yeah, the, the results are, they look great. Yeah, I, I've tried it a, a couple times. It's It has a like very different, uh, how do you call it, timetable, I guess. Right. Well, it's uh, it's not uh, like Flash at all. So right. <laughs> you kind of open it up, you pick up a brush, and you draw some uh, uh, drawings, and oh, the brush feels awesome. I, I totally will move to this software now. And then you try to create animation, and you like, how do I create a new frame? How do I create a new layer? <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, they they uh, organize the frames much closer to the traditional way of doing it. It's what they call a dope sheet. And so it's instead of horizontal, which you and I are used to in Flash, it's a vertical uh, you know, set of frames. So, yeah, it takes some getting used to. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not familiar with it uh, at all. Uh, I mean, I, I saw how it looks like traditional uh, this timing sheets, I guess. I don't know how, how they call it even, but uh, I don't know how they work. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they've got, uh, they've got various pricing on their website and you're right. It's, um, it's costly. Yeah. I mean, the, the basic one is $21 a month. The mid range, which is probably what the average freelancer would want, is about fifty two dollars a month. I pay the same, and I get the entire Adobe suite right. of apps. Like that's Photoshop, Illustrator, exactly. you know, InDesign. Yeah. So not one app. I get eight or twelve. Or I can't remember. I've lost count. I don't use them all. But well, uh, that, that I mean, even if you even if you're obviously making your bread and butter from animation $52 a month for this one thing is still a lot. Yeah. 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 I, I've even been exploring some other options like uh, blender, which is typically known for 3d animation. Mm-hmm. They've actually been working to make it uh, supportive for 2d animators as well. Oh, that's there's cool. a, a function in it called, I think uh, grease pencil or something oh. like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, has some pretty cool functions. You should look it up because blender is, essentially an open source product so it's free um, yeah i'm familiar with the, the 3d part of it but i haven't uh, tried any 2d animation yeah me neither and I, the one thing that's keeping me from it is that i've heard it's it's a lot of learning hmm. right it's yeah blender is i've i've messed with it myself and as with most open source projects that are like Adobe products like GIMP, which is a, a really good uh, Photoshop replacement for open source, but it is the menuing system, the navigation is nothing 
like Photoshop. And if you're like most of us, you learned on Photoshop and everything you know there, you don't want to relearn it. I'm yeah. lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I well, want to focus on the art. And I want to make sure we're not putting Photoshop on a pedestal because I do <laughs> really enjoy Photoshop. But right. what I don't understand is why, as an illustrator and as someone that works in graphic design, why I find Adobe Illustrator so difficult to use because oh, yeah. nothing yeah. is the same as it is in right. Photoshop. We're talking about the same company. Like right, right. the arrow tool and the arrow tool should do the same thing, right. but they don't, right? And or there are different hotkeys, and it's it's just a nightmare going from app to app. And I've done some work recently um, where I had to do a quick logo and have it in vector. I did it in Adobe Animate because it was faster for me. Because right. even even though it's ten years old, the the Adobe Animate hotkeys are still in my brain, <laughs> <laughs> and I could work I could work in Animate to draw something faster and export it as an EPS to Illustrator and be just and then send that to the client and be like, here you go. <laughs> yeah, I do the same. <laughs> oh my god, it's it's ridiculous. So Alex, with with your Hand-drawn uh, animation. Are you working with any special hardware? Do you have a tablet? Yeah, I have a, a Wacom Intuos Pro tablet, oh, and it's working uh, pretty fine. I've tried the uh, Cintiq ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought it, <laughs> uh, thinking of this is will be my like final uh, top tier uh, tablet but right. I didn't like it <laughs> and so I'm yeah there I I'm with you because if you the same thing there's a big learning curve to going from the Intuos which is something you have to learn to disconnect so you have to go okay I'm drawing here on this surface but my you know, on the screen, things are changing. But then when you go back to a Cintiq, uh, you're actually drawing directly on the surface, but it's just, you're like drawing just a little bit above the surface. And it's a learning curve to go from those two forms. As a matter of fact, the biggest problem I had, I, I had it into us forever. Uh, and the biggest problem I had with the Cintiq was getting used to having my hand in the way uh, that, that's I, true for me right I just you start drawing and what wait and there's a hand in my way <laughs> and, <laughs> what is this hand doing here yeah and uh, how how will i see what i'm drawing right now because right where i put my hand and right. so i moved back <laughs> yes I had the same it's, problem. It's so strange because most of us start off with pencil and paper right. where, where your hand is in the way. But right. for some reason, <laughs> if you get used to uh, using a tablet that's not built into the screen, mm -hmm. you, you kind of get used to having that unobstructed view, especially yeah. when you're doing certain lines. Like if you're taking a line horizontally from left to right, you know, you can see where you're going with it, you know, right. <laughs> Whereas you kind of have to guess if, uh, if it's on the screen. Yeah. See, I'll argue the opposite. I've, I found my Cintiq to be a lot better, but I, I'm going to say that it's probably because of the size. It's probably because I can draw from my shoulder on the Cintiq and I can't draw from my shoulder because I've never owned a big tablet. I've only ever owned like a six by eight. So it's all very minute movements. Well, see, that's the key, I think. No yeah. matter what tab, no matter what you're using, it has to be like the biggest one you can get. The bigger one, yeah. Although yeah, yeah, the yeah. problem is, once once you get those ones, you, you can never really go back. It just starts <laughs> to feel too. Cold. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like bandwidth on your internet. You know, yeah. once you yeah. get the nice high speed one, you, you just can't go back. Yeah. The they, thing that I continue to struggle with with my Cintiq, it's got nothing to do with the Cintiq itself. It's the fact of of what do I do with the keyboard and how do I use my hotkeys comfortably without like reaching underneath it or leaning oh, over to the yeah. side. Like when you're drawing at a, at a drafting table, there's no hotkeys. So you can put both <laughs> your hands up on the up on the desk. You can spin your paper with one hand and you can draw with the other. Well, on on the Cintiq, like you've got to have the undo key and you've got to be able to switch between mm -hmm. your, your hand tool and your pen tool and your brush tool. 
And I find it incredibly frustrating. I never use the buttons actually on the Cintiq. Yeah. You know, I probably again to cite your 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 um, point earlier, Brian, is that I could if I really wanted to sit down and try to learn them all, but it's just like it's like training a new Nintendo glove, you know, <laughs> 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 trying to figure out what you need to do. The uh, the other thing too is if you're looking, if you decide you don't want to go with, if I was starting from scratch, I would say if you can afford it, get a Cintiq. However, they are very expensive. The Intuos is a little less expensive. But you do, I'm going to echo what Matt said, you want a larger one, mm. you know, like what Joel said, because you've got to be able to draw with your elbow and your shoulder. Uh, however, when you're doing the Intuos, the, the best thing to do is to get one that is the closest to the size of the screen you're looking at. So if you have a 21-inch monitor you'll want to get the large Intuos because you want it to be close as a one-to-one -one ratio mm -hmm. as possible because otherwise you'll be drawing teeny tiny little circles on a great big screen and it's just it's, it's tough to learn that way. So artists starting out, nothing wrong with an Intuos because they are much less expensive. Uh, try to get one that matches the, the, the screen real estate that's on your on your monitor. Uh, if you have lots of money, just get the Cintiq. Psh, duh. <laughs> Alex, I got to I gotta ask Alex. Uh, yep. I'm not familiar with the the art market in Russia. Is it hard to get uh, Cintiqs and in Intuises? Or can you run down to the store and pick them up? How does, how does that work there? Uh, you, uh, we have some online shops. Mm-hmm online stores where where you can get them but uh, usually you don't have a chance to try it out anywhere just uh, online stores so it, for the the big investments you're uh, going to make some people don't want to spend so much money without trying it out because it's it's kind of risky and uh, there's no real way to try it out here, I think. Sometimes in, uh, at some conventions or uh, conferences, you have a Wacom booth where you can try it out, but it's rare. Right. So it's, it you, sounds, it's, it's very similar to the U.S. Most places, you can't uh, just go to the store and look at them. Best Buy, a large chain here in the U.S., used to have uh, Wacom tablets where you could go in, but they were never set up. You never could play on them. <laughs> uh, so same situation here. Usually when you go to conventions, uh, that's when you have the opportunity. If if Wacom is there, uh, you'll get an opportunity to look at it. Okay, so answer that question right away. Um, yeah, and actually for... For Russia, they are very expensive. Like oh, the, yeah. uh, we have a different um, level of salaries here. So for people who are who are not working for foreign companies or who are working working for uh, on local projects, uh, Wacom Cintiq are like hugely overpriced, and uh, yeah. uh, not many people can afford it yeah they're not cheap here either i, I mean, think you yeah i understand about, <laughs> yeah you could say that about just about any wacom or right. wacom <laughs> product i mean but they're worth it i had one tablet it was a big 12 by 12 i had it for over a decade i had it like mm. for close to 15 years and uh the only reason i got rid of it is because the soft the windows would no longer support it they didn't make drivers for it anymore. Right. But, right. you know, so, yeah, they're expensive, but you can use them forever. Yes, yeah, true. This yeah, true. the quality is, like, good. They are pretty much the best uh, comparing to other companies that make tablets. Right. But I guess when you are <laughs> on the top of the market, you can do whatever you want. The right. prices. <laughs> Now, Have you ever Alex, had the opportunity to try an iPad Pro? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, people say 
that it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I've heard the same thing too. I have, I have not had the opportunity to draw for an extended period on an iPad pro myself, but I've seen some people do some really amazing things, but it just goes back to the fact, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the tool. It's going to be the artist and the artist who finds a way to make it work. I mean, have you ever seen some people do artwork in MS Paint? That is a <laughs> crap tool that uh, people find a way to most to make the most amazing things. So, some people a, draw with the mouse. Yeah, people people draw. People do all kinds of stuff. You just you find a, an artist will find a way. Alex, <laughs> it's like Jurassic Paint. It, right, Jurassic <laughs> Paint. <laughs> Alex. You are you are working as uh, you are currently working freelance uh, yes. right now. Now you've worked for some companies in the past, and I'm assuming that's where we're seeing some of this, um, some of these visual effects things that we were looking at uh, for Battle Chasers and Dungeon Defenders. Um, working as a freelancer, how is that different for you now? Uh. It has some pros and cons. Mm. Right now, I'm actually uh, want to get uh, the in-house job. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I feel I'm at the point where <laughs> I need to talk to some people. Right. For <laughs> at least once a week, because <laughs> uh, sitting at home uh, all all the time is uh, might be. A bit challenging for some people, right? Uh, and in terms of personal uh, growth as an artist, it's uh, it uh, obviously better to be around other artists, right? Uh, which can uh, inspire you and uh, give you some feedback. You can ask them some questions, mm -hmm. uh, and but working as a freelancer. Uh, like I have a more mm, fluid mm -hmm. schedule, I guess that's the word. Yeah. I can uh, move my work hour, hours uh, back and forth, and uh, yeah, it it's pretty cool. <laughs> right. It is. They all have pros and cons. I'm with you. I do like the structure. Of working for a company, but I do like doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Who doesn't like that? <laughs> I mean, that's Joel's whole philosophy. Do what I want <laughs> when I want to do it. That's how he lives life. I'm putting words so. in my mouth, but I do en I do enjoy <laughs> most of the lifestyle, uh, you know, a lot of two, <clears throat> excuse me, freelance work. Uh, I, I think it's tougher, and imagine... Um, Alex, you can probably uh, identify with this, that I'm in Canada, so the winters can be kind of miserable. There's not a lot of outside time. I'm, su I'm assuming Russia is very similar as far as long winters. And when you're yeah. at home working by yourself, you're kind of itching for springtime. Even if it's just, even if you're still working by yourself down at the local coffee shop, at least you're outside, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I'm mostly... Uh, interested in uh, meeting other people as a uh, like the hugest plus of working in house mm. right. and uh, considering my specialization special effects for especially for games mm -hmm. it requires a lot of um, uh, integration in the project because it's very technical process. It's not just you are making assets and send it over to uh, the company. Right. And it's it might be quite hard when you don't uh, have people around which can help you, which you can uh, mm -hmm. uh, ask some something. And considering I'm like in completely opposite time zone from <laughs> the U.S., it's like right. Uh, I'm uh, 11 hours ahead, mm -hmm. and usually there are, when I have some questions, my colleagues are asleep, <laughs> 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 and you just 
figure it out himself. Right. I like that. Now, I noticed uh, I was, when I was going through your work, I was on Vimeo, and I noticed a few years back you did some great uh, animation of a pug dog on a swing going back and forth. And that character animation was just, it was beautiful, and I loved it. So is is there a reason why you are doing uh, visual effects instead of character animation, which you seem to be totally capable of doing? Is there a reason why you're doing the visual effects over character animation? Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you like it. People <laughs> seem to enjoy this animation a lot. And right. It's really flattering because I don't do lots of uh, original stuff. It's mostly uh, like uh, special effects for games or fan arts. And this piece is one of the few which is like original idea, which right. I was uh, willing to do. And as for your question, I just know, uh, I think special effects are more appealing to me in general. It's uh, quite quite interesting to figure it out. And I think that you have more room for your personal style in uh, special effects. I mean, you can draw a character in your own style, I guess. Right. I just personally I feel that I have more room when I'm drawing like abstract shapes and right. it uh, has a bit more of my personal touch on it. That's that's awesome. That's a, that's a great answer. <laughs> I love that answer. That's good. So uh, when you're when you're sitting down to to animate something for the afternoon like what is there any kind of inside baseball tricks that you can share with us about Animating something complicated like flames or smoke? Uh, it's it's uh, the hardest thing at first. You need to keep track of lots of uh, uh, parts and particles. You just basically need to be uh, focused, I guess. Mm-hmm. And... It's a bi- It's very technical process. It's uh, when you're thinking about it logically, and uh, you can make it pretty easy. Just the technical process of keeping things in the place they need to be when you know where they need to be. But uh, the hard part of is uh, making it look appealing and cool. Mm-hmm. And right. You, for this part, I usually look for some references. And you just need to... When I was starting, I was uh, thinking that uh, when you're making animation, you... Okay, I used, you're starting, starting with a couple of like uh, cool-looking frames, and then you're just uh, animating uh, straight ahead, and you don't really care of... How it looks, you just may, it's a technical process. And I think it was okay, but I moved to a philosophy of you need to make every frame look good. If you make a, a pause, uh, the frame should be good looking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a hard part because sometimes you need to move something a certain way. And you just move it, and <laughs> technically, it it's not uh, appealing. It's, it won't look good if you're doing it the right way, how it will uh, like work in real life. Because mm. s- sometimes in real life, uh, the shapes are not as appealing as uh, you can make them. Right. So... Uh, when you're drawing from uh, nature, from fire, you're kind of picking up the best frames. And right. s- something in the middle might uh, 
not look as good. And right. uh, your work is to make every frame look uh, appealing. And it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm trying to concentrate on that. Well, it's a great philosophy, too. And it's one I think artists need to keep in mind at all times is that we're, we're not in the business of what's real. We're in the business of what looks good. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. That's a good way to describe it. Hmm. All right. So let's see here. Uh, oh, I had, I had another question. Where was it at? Oh, so if, if I'm, so in, in addition to that question, if I'm looking to get into visual effects, uh, how important is something like Unity in that equation? Because I know we've talked about the tools we've used to create the elements, but how far do you go into implementing them? Like, do you actually get into a, a game engine like Unity uh, and put that in place for somebody? Uh, okay, so I have very few experience with, uh, with 3D engines, but... Mm -hmm. They, uh, well, uh, I worked on Battle Chasers, uh, the last game I worked on for uh, two years, and right. I was uh, the only one uh, who did uh, special effects. Right. And I had no experience in 3D engines at all before this project. And uh, Joe Madureira contacted me and said, I like your stuff want to be our special effects artist? And go, yeah, sure. It's a pleasure. And oh, and by the way, we work in Unity. Can you yeah. figure it out? Yeah, okay. okay, sure. Anything for you, Joe. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I figured it out on the go. It was lots of new stuff. I had no idea how anything 3D worked like right. meshes textures uh wh what is a polygon <laughs> right I mean, so it's was it was completely new stuff and well i i managed to finish the project somehow and it, it works people seems to enjoy it so i think if you're a uh, uh, experienced well, you need to be focusing on the art, mm -hmm. and so Unity is a tool which is a way more easier to learn a tool than to like improve as an artist. So, as long as you uh, can make stuff look good, I think uh, you can uh, learn the tools that needed to make it work in uh, 3D engines for, for a game or for a movie. Right. So, yeah. Hmm. All right. So I have looked at Unity, and I thought Photoshop was hard. <laughs> I'm not interested. No, I'm just kidding. It actually looks, it actually looks pretty good. So, Alex, um, we're getting to the last couple of minutes of the show. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us about um, about your visual effects work and your other work. Thank you also for uh, meeting with us on a Saturday because you're right. Because when you're working, the rest of the world over here we might be doing something else. So we've kind of found a way to uh, meet in the middle, uh, which was 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, for me. So thank you for coming coming to the show and and uh, and being patient with us as well. Because I know uh, talking to someone in a different language, I know English is not your native language. By the way, you speak English very well. Thanks. Uh, I, I, you're great at that. I wish I could speak some Russian. Uh, I cannot. Um, but thank you for being on the show. Uh, I'm going to let Matt ask a question that he likes to ask every episode. Matt? I do indeed. Yes, Alex. Are there any artists that our listeners should be aware of and should be following? Uh, yeah, if you're interested in uh, special effects, uh, there are lots of uh, cool guys on 
Vimeo. I mm -hmm. following, for example, uh, like uh, Chris Graff. He has some uh, awesome uh, 2D animations. And um, I will butcher his name, but <laughs> Naoki uh, Araiza Tokumasu. All right. He's a... Uh, he he worked on uh, the animated show Wakfu. I don't know if you are familiar with it. It's actually a French animated sh uh, series. Okay. Which I usually I'm not very familiar with the uh, like European uh, mm. animations, but this uh, series is quite big and it's really cool. It has uh, awesome animations and a good story. And yeah, he did a great job with it. And also, it's not like an artist, but uh, yeah. old Capcom fighting games are a oh, huge yeah. inspiration. And I will recommend everyone who is interested in special effects and character animations to check it out. It's also very easy to check it frame by frame because it's all sprite sheet based mm -hmm. and you can find uh, these sprite sheets online very easily. Cool. I gotta check that out. Now you're talking my language. <laughs> I like it. Alright, Alex, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Uh, is there a specific place that people should go visit you on the internet? Is the Vimeo site uh, the best place or where should people go to see you? Uh, Vimeo, Station, and uh, DeviantArt are the like the biggest places I I'm on. Right, got it. And we're gonna put those links in the show notes. If you're watching the video, you'll see down at the bottom. I put the Art Station uh, URL down there. Um, are are there any new projects, Alex, that you're working on that we need to know about, or is all kind of hush hush right now? Until we get there, it's it's hush hush. <laughs> All right, we'll take we'll take hush hush. <laughs> when uh when it, when something big comes around, let us know. We'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, we've it's been a true pleasure, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure. Absolutely. So you go enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll uh we'll let you know when this goes live, which will be very soon. It's actually already live. If you're on Twitch, it will be thrown hey, out on YouTube. Yeah, hey Twitch, everybody in Twitch. Twitch land. Alex, thank you so much, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, thank you for having me. See Absolutely. Ya. Thank you. See you. Oh, I love Alex. That was great. That was fun. All the way to Russia. We did How about it, Joel. that? Did yeah, that? no, that uh, that worked out really well. I thought it was great. Oh, I, I, I know we had to do it on Saturday. It was a little bit different, but it was good. Thanks to the chat room for being here do today as well. We broadcast this live usually on Thursday nights on twitch.tv forward slash Brian Dunaway. Uh, this was a little special deal we did today on this Saturday to uh, be able to meet up with Alex. That was great. Shout out. It's March of Robots. Da Costa, who we've had on the show before is drawing a new robot every day in March. You can follow him on Chocolate Soup, and that soup is spelled S-S-O-P on Instagram. And there's a lot of artists involved right now with the March of Robots. If you're an artist and you want, or if you are following an artist who is doing something for March of Robots, let us know. Shoot us a message over on Twitter. Uh, Comics C to C is our handle over there. Um... What else? What else is there? Uh, I want to thank the patrons uh, for your for your patronage to the show. Uh, couldn't do it without you. Uh, who else we got to thank? Joel. Anybody else need some thinking? Just Matt to Charm. Oh well, well, yeah, but I mean, thank you <laughs> to Joel. Also, like Joel said at the top of the show, he's doing once a week StarcrossedOnline.com. Got a new comic every week. I'm enjoying what you're doing. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, man. Hey, Thanks. It's good. Else? It's good to be back. It's good to be back. Yeah. I, I honestly, it's, I'm, I've been having a lot of fun in my Discord community, and that is, it's a combo. Uh, people that follow the Star Crossed work and my artwork, uh, and people that follow the Citadel Cafe are all part of the same Discord server that I have, and that's all accessible through Patreon. So if you go to Patreon.com/slash Joel Duggan or/slash The Citadel Cafe, depending on which 
project you're a fan of, then you can hop in there and join the Discord. And we've been having a lot of fun, especially in Minecraft. But there's there's other conversations as well. Uh, I went to go see Black Panther this week, so we were talking about that and stuff like that too. Oh, cool. Oh, well, I want to circle back back around to Black Panthers in a second, but uh, give Matthew Sharm his due. Thank you, Matt. Where can people visit you? Indeed. Best place to see my work is on YouTube. Just do a search for Matt the Wad or Matthew Ducharme. Excellent. Follow me at the Brian Dunaway on most social networks except for Twitch, where it's just Brian Dunaway. I was there first. Suck it, other <laughs> Brian Dunaway. Uh, but okay, so you went and saw Black Panther. We're not going to give any spoilers here, but I do nope. have a Black Panther related story. Uh, not too long ago, I had mentioned on the show. That you they uh there is uh, a Black Panther comic series that is free on Amazon, which you can apply to your Comicsology account or just add it directly to your uh, Amazon account. Uh, it was sponsored by Lexus. Now, free. However, <laughs> the whole thing is just a big ad for Lexus. Oh no! So is is the most is the most tied in marketing thing I have seen since the eighties when we wow. used to do nothing but market towards you know towards kids and uh, it's just I don't know how to describe it. The first comic is okay. It's a freebie. The first comic is kind of an introduction to where we went uh, in the Marvel universe and mm -hmm. how we were introduced to the black panther most recently and then but then by the second book they're full on solving the problem by creating a lexus <laughs> it's the weirdest weirdest marketing choice it it it, it pains me greatly because the artwork is gorgeous and the story could be great but then they had this mechanic thing that has to fit in with the Lexus universe. It's really weird. But if at least